Welcome, everybody. It looks like uh, most people are here, although we might have a few trickle in during the motivation prayers. So if you want to get yourself ready for class, we'll start with the motivation. And reciting aloud if you feel comfortable. Sange chodon sogi chodon bhaya janchu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki drola penche sange drupa sho sange chodon sogi chodon bhaya janchu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki Rola penche sange jupa sho sange chudon so ki chunam la jan chupadu dani kapsu chi dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki rola penche sange jupa sho. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of generosity through the guideline teaching for enhancing the mind that gives without attachment, namely transforming our bodies, wealth, and collection of virtues over the three times into the objects desired by each and every sentient being. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of moral discipline, working for the sake of sentient beings enacting virtuous deeds, and not transgressing the bounds of the Pratamoksha, Bodhisattva, and Tantric vows, even at the cost of our lives. Should even the myriad beings of the three realms without exception become angry at us, humiliate, criticize, threaten, or even kill us, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of patience not to be distraught, but to work for their benefit in response to their harm. Even if we must remain for an ocean of eons in the fiery hells of Avicii, for the sake of one sentient being alone, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of joyous effort, to strive with compassion for supreme enlightenment and not to be discouraged. Having abandoned the faults of dullness, agitation, and mental wandering, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of meditative concentration, through the samadhi of single-pointed placement upon the nature of reality, which is that all things are void of true existence. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of wisdom through the space-like yoga of single-minded placement upon ultimate truth, conjoined with the ecstasy and great bliss induced by the discriminating wisdom analyzing suchness. We seek your blessings to perfect samadhi on illusion, by realizing how all external phenomena lack true existence yet still appear like a mirage, a dream, or the image of the moon on a still lake. Samsara and Nirvana lack even an atom of true existence, while cause and effect and dependent arising are unfailing. We seek your blessings to discern the import of Nagarjuna's thought, which is that these two are complementary and not contradictory. And so we go for refuge until we're enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By our merits from giving and other perfections, may we become Buddhas to benefit all sentient beings. Letting the motivation really connect. This is why we engage in study, contemplation, meditation, whether formally or informally. And we remind ourselves that a perfection or paramita, that these six perfections are aspirations and activities directed toward achieving Buddhahood. And someone with uncontrived bodhicitta is called a bodhisattva. May we become bodhisattvas soon. Okay, so nice to see everybody. And um, last week we were looking at joyous effort and we were did a bit of a deep dive into particularly this power of steadfastness, which from a Buddhist perspective is like positive pride. And your homework, um, if you decided to do your homework, was to ask yourself, what is the difference between confidence and pride? What is the difference between feeling 
you know, like self-worth, feeling confident of your abilities or confident in your potential, um, you know, happy with who you are, you know, warts and all, as opposed to pride, which is uh, a different vibe. Um, how would you describe it experientially or how would you describe it at all? Pride and confidence. Yeah, Angel, go ahead. Um, so whenever I'm feeling, so for both emotions, both pride and confidence, they, I would say they both arise from an incident that has occurred in our past, which had a, some output that we as an individual would label um, positive. Mm. Um, and I would say that the difference is mainly with pride, the, the data, I guess, that was consumed was more relative to the self. And with confidence, the data that was consumed was a little bit more holistic. So it was more whole. Mm. So as a human, um, one way that I guess that I consume data more holistic it's by taking the the input of others when making decisions so if i'm considering someone else's um feelings then that means the output that i'm going to be producing assuming that i read the feelings of that person well then it's going to be a little bit more confidence if had i made the same decision without taking their input it would have produced, assuming that the output was positive, it would have been a little bit more prideful, I would say. So it deals more with how well your data, like how whole your data is, I would say. That's, yeah. that's a really interesting framing. That's a cool framing. I, I like that a lot. It's, uh, and it's definitely resonating with the Buddhist explanation, which is one is afflicted and one is not afflicted or less afflicted, you know, but I, I like the idea that you know, you're really this holistic idea of taking in consideration the needs of others actually makes you less prideful. Yeah. And if you have pride, you're actually kind of just maybe worried about how you look right? or how you appear to others, but you're not taking in consideration. Is this useful to them? Is it beneficial to them? Is this for the greater good? You're just thinking, do I look stupid or not? Or have I dominated them or not or proven something to them or not it's it's much less aware of their needs I think that's a very cool framing yeah other thoughts that came to you guys when you were unpacking just for you as an individual when you're in a more confident headspace as opposed to a more pride headspace what are defining features yeah Eve go ahead yeah, I think that they're day and night. I don't think that it's self-confidence or pride. So here's how I distinguish between them. Um, self-confidence is like the little engine that could, you know, it's that general feeling that I think I can do things during the day that I need to do. Um, it really doesn't have a lot of uh, resentment attached to it for any reason. Whereas for me, pride, usually has uh, like a whole string of negative feelings attached to it. So let's say I'm doing something and um, I'm feeling self-confident, but I fail the actual action. Self-confidence can shrug it off. Whereas pride, um, I, I know it's pride because then like, you know, I, my cheeks get red, I get embarrassed, I snap at the next person I see. So self-confidence and pride act differently for me. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, some people can't catch the difference until it doesn't go well, as you put it, right? Like you're, you're feeling like I can do this, whatever this is. And then if it fails, you only know if it was pride or confidence when it fails. Because as you mentioned, if it's confidence, you go, oh, whoops, must not have had all the right information. Try again. You know, and it's kind of do to do. And if it's pride, you're like, oh, they're going to know. <laughs> whoever they are, whatever it is to know. Um, but if you can catch it before it fails, that's of course key. And it sounds like you can do that just fine. Um, we, we each have different afflictions we're more blind to than others. So I think sometimes these exercises are really useful because we might be totally on top of our anger. Like it happens, it's there, but we know it when we see it. We know what our anger looks like. 
but we might not know what our pride looks like or our attachment looks like until we really consciously turn the spotlight on it, using what we know of the teachings, bringing it to our daily experience. You know, what is that unsettled feeling? What's the, what's the frame or the heading for it? Because then you can know the antidotes and you can know the way through it or ways to prevent it. Um, yeah, Tenzin, did you have one earlier? Uh, I was just going to say, I feel like with pride, there's a sense of superiority, mm. whereas I am superior because maybe, maybe it's about some type of knowledge that I have. And I feel prideful about that knowledge. So I'm like, okay, if I'm superior, then there's definitely something, someone that's inferior. Yeah, definitely. Um, but with confidence, it's more like a level plane. You know, there's yeah. no superior and inferior. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, 100%. There's no competition when it's confidence, but there's an implication of competition when there's pride or there's an implication that I'm better at all times and a maintaining of that positioning. It's all about this kind of positioning of one up. And um, it's, it's really hard to speak to someone who is in a prideful position. If they're really holding that, then it's hard to collaborate. You know, it's hard to join your ideas to theirs. There's no space. Um, it's hard to confront because there's no space, you know, so you can't share and join and have fun with them, but you also can't tweak and adjust and modify things either. Cause there's just like this rock of my actions and ideas are me and you better not challenge me. So if you challenge my actions and ideas, you're challenging me and you know, you're stupid. <laughs> right? Like, And from the Buddhist perspective, pride is just simply looking down. It's a looking down for sure. Um, and confidence is very much as you mentioned. And the idea of confidence is also built on identifying with your potential. Yeah, so your potential is to become enlightened and everyone's potential is to become enlightened. And it's not a race, <laughs> you know? And if everyone else gets there first, great. You don't have to worry about them, you know? But um, if everyone's potential is the same, then you know, you're not kind of feeling this like I'm better or worse than anyone else. You're just feeling like I can do anything. It's just a matter of time and practice and conditions. So if I can't do something, it's not like a failing. It's that things haven't come together for it to happen yet. Um, I read a bunch of different texts on the same subject. And one of them, it mentioned the um, positive spiritual pride being like a lion who protects, um, well, maybe they're young, but also, um, you know, it, it, it's like that you realize that you're doing this as um, a higher thing. I don't know if that's the right word, but anyway, um, you're proud because you know you're doing this for the right reason. And, um, it's not proud like the I don't know. I'm not really good at talking. No, you're you're, you're pointing to something important. Yeah, the, this idea of um, I guess protector, like a lioness. Yeah, who protects her cubs, and you are in a way bigger, and you are in a way stronger. But you know that your cubs are also going to be big and strong someday too. So it's not like you're better than them, but you're protecting, right. you're holding. Yeah, yeah. And there's something something really beautiful about that analogy. And you're quite right, it is in some of the traditional texts. Absolutely. So, so this idea of confidence is a complete connection with joyous effort. Joyous effort and confidence go together. And that's something important to sit with when you're not having joyous effort. Yeah, think of when you don't have joyous effort, when you're feeling burnout, or you're feeling lack of motivation, lack of inspiration, just low energy fatigue. It's not always about a lack of confidence, but it often has a relationship. And that's not something we immediately go to. That's not like an immediate sort of thought you have of, I'm tired because I'm not confident. What? That, I'm tired because I'm tired. I'm tired because I'm busy. But what, what are the things that shore up confidence? Support, yeah, connection validation, all of which you can give to yourself without anything external, 
but for us regular folks, it sometimes helps to have something external. Yes, or at least little infusions of it here and there. And then, you know, just raw physical tiredness can be addressed with pacing. <laughs> yes, pacing and rest. But I think that it, it's something very deep to in explore there of what is the relationship between my burnout and my confidence? Because when you lose confidence, you're also kind of in the mood to set yourself up for failure. Like you start a project, but you're not really feeling up to it or really feeling faith in your ability to see it through to the end. So you're almost tired and overwhelmed before you even begin. Yeah, it's just daunting. And there's a lot of ways out of this and we'll, we'll explore some of those, but I think that this is something interesting that Buddhism has to say about burnout and fatigue is that it often has a relationship with lack of confidence. It's just something to kind of make a mental note for a thinking project on a quiet day. So we're gonna jump into these different powers that support joyous effort, one of which is this confidence, and then looking at some of the different types of joyous effort that we can build into our life. And then we're gonna pivot and shift to um, the perfection of concentration. So we only have a couple more classes of this series. We're gonna finish the first week of December. So um, we're nearing the end, but we'll get through all of the perfections. So we are up to joyous effort and we've been talking about it already a bit. And we talked about these four and then we did the deep dive into the power of steadfastness. So it's not to say that the rest of them aren't important. It's just that I think the rest of them get addressed more often in lots of other classes. So I'm kind of highlighting this one because I think it deserves more airtime than it normally gets. But just to review this power of aspiration, this is remembering the benefits. Yeah, creating a, a positive drive or a positive ambition through remembering the point of it. And aspiration is not the same thing as doing. It's building up energy to want to, to engage with, so that when you finally do it, you've got a lot of mental energy behind it. Um, if you've ever been hanging out for a certain retreat or for a certain practice for many years, and then finally it comes, because of the power of your aspiration, you often engage with that teaching a lot more deeply than if you just kind of landed there. So we can kind of consciously manufacture this aspiration by remembering on purpose the benefits of what we're doing. And then we'll come back to this power of steadfastness. The power of joy, this is just this idea of how kids are when they play. When kids are playing, they are expending huge amounts of energy, but because they're filled with this joy, even tiring sports are great fun. So we're trying to engage with our work with this same mentality that beginning, middle and end of the positive activity, this is worthwhile, this gives us mental contentment. And then all we have to worry about is looking after the body and pacing the body so that we won't run out of gas. Yeah, rather than the other way around, which is, can my body handle this? You're kind of getting your mind settled and then it's easier to look after the body in a way that's not overly, I guess, protective of it for lack of a better word, or overly precious about it. So just unpacking this power of joy a little bit. When you're grumpy, don't you get more specific about your needs? When you're grumpy, you want a certain kind of food and a certain kind of ambiance in your house, level of noise, level of quiet you want a certain temperature, you want certain clothing experiences and not other clothing experiences. Oh, this is too itchy. Oh, this is too warm. When you're grumpy, lots of things annoy you and you get very specific about your needs. When you have a joyful mind, when your mind is full of contentment, you're just like, oh, food. Yes, I like food. Eat, eat, eat. Oh, clothes. Clothes are important. Put them on, you know, and you just kind of like, go through the checklist of what your human needs are, but you don't get so particular. You don't kind of squish it or get tight about it. You know, like I need to sit on a chair. All right, this'll do. <laughs> and part of you has already made peace with the fact that your body's never gonna be 100% comfortable. It just won't. It's a samsaric body. It's gonna always be annoying. 
but it's going to annoy you less the more you're in your mental experience of contentment. So when you're in a mental experience of contentment, you look after your body, but not in this tight, squished, grumpy way, this self-cherishing way. It's just really logistical and then moving on. And similar with kids, right? When they're playing and playing and playing, they don't even notice that they're getting cold. And sometimes their parents have to say, oh, put on a coat. But, you know, they're really not fussed because they're just enjoying their work so much. So from an adult perspective, we know, oh, it's cold, put on a coat, but you're not so worried if it's not quite warm enough, if you'll still be healthy at the end, or if it's a little too warm, but you'll still be healthy at the end. You don't care. So this is one really good way to catch if you're losing joyous effort is when your needs get a little bit too specific. Yeah, it's not like you can't have needs. It's just that tightness around it. Um, you know, you might have genuine dietary restrictions, but then you become brand specific and texture specific and temperature specific, and they get even more specific than your actual dietary issue that you genuinely need to work on. You know, um, you can also notice this in your friends. Perhaps you already are as we're talking, right? <laughs> when your friends get a little bit uptight about stuff, they've lost their joy. So instead of, you know, kind of being like, oh my God, can you just lighten up? Can you just relax? Can you just enjoy this? You realize they're getting uptight and specific because there's something stressing them out right now. So don't punish them for being stressed, kind of take a step back and check what's happening right now, really. Because of course, if someone is in this state and you try and fix it with addressing their specific needs, those needs are endless when you're in that headspace. You'll get them just the right drink and then they'll worry about food and then they'll worry about the chair and then they'll worry about the temperature and then they'll worry about your tone of voice and then they'll worry about, and it's, it's endless when you're in that state. So it can be exhausting for you as the caregiver or the friend or the partner to try and be like, oh, just tell me what you need. Their needs are endless, don't worry about it. Try and get into why are they so stressed? Take a step back. Yeah, what's going on here? But of course, always more important is knowing these triggers in yourself, addressing them in yourself. But sometimes when you remember your friends' weird ways in their grumpy days, it can give you kind of a sense of that, and then you can bring that to your own personal experience. Okay, so the power of joy is an important one, and then we're revisiting the power of relinquishment because it needs revisiting. And this is right in the Lam Rim. This is not me making it up. Lama Tsongkhapa says, when you're tired, rest. So this is called the power of relinquishment or moderation or rest, depending on your translator. And it's to prevent burnout and illness by noticing when you're tired and deciding to rest before you've burned out so that you can continue positive actions later once you've rested. So rather than pushing yourself to the limit because you're doing something virtuous and it's important and death is coming and you're serving the llama and whatever, whatever reasons you have in your head and think I have to push myself to the outer limits and totally drain my adrenal glands or totally burn myself out. And then I'm somehow a worthy spiritual practitioner or now I'm somehow a good student. That's actually spiritual immaturity. Actually having boundaries and resting before you burn out is spiritual maturity. And it's healthy pacing. And it's what means you will be able to continue your work for the welfare of sentient beings through your whole life. So when you're at, when you're at a Dharma center or you're in a retreat or you're volunteering, it's so easy to get swept up in the peer pressure. Yeah, the peer pressure of go, 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 get it done, get it done. And almost a little bit performative or a little bit competitive, but also just you don't want to let down the team. Yeah, and the team is working so hard and you don't want to be the one that kind of flags. And the problem with that mentality is one, thinking that anyone notices, right? People are worried about their own life. They don't care what you're doing. And if they do, it's probably self-cherishing. So who cares? One, right? 
But two, it's really asking yourself, what is the long game? Do I want to work my ass off for one event? Or do I want to love the path and work for these events or work for this center or work for this aim for my whole life? And I've seen so many people genuinely inspired, genuinely loving the Dharma that go in full speed ahead and then they burn out and then they don't wanna do anything. It's not like they suddenly wanna do less or they start to manage properly. No, they push until their very limit and then give it up altogether. So in a way it's better to err on the side of being a little bit lazy because it'll mean you keep doing it forever. Imagine if you died today and were reborn in a Buddhist family who supported your spiritual practice and you go through your adolescence slightly less jangly than this time. Yeah, say it's a more smooth adolescence because of your merit, yay. You get to adulthood. Will you want to keep practicing the Dharma purely related to the mental habits you have now? Or were your mental habits with the Dharma say, I love this once, but there was pain there too, not this time. You know, imagine you don't remember anything from your past life. All you have is imprints. All you have is just impressions. Are your impressions positive ones? Do they have positive emotional content and positive heart connection? Or have you been loading your Dharma practice with all sorts of coulda, woulda, shoulda, all sorts of I am bad, all sorts of pressure, pressure, so then when you meet it again, you have this anxiety because that could happen to us if we don't maintain a joyful mind. It's unlikely that our path will be so profound this life that we will remember all of our past lives next time. It could happen, it totally could, but imagine it's similar to this time where we don't remember our past lives or we only remember little flickery memory, dreamy like things which may or may not be past lives. They could just be imagination, they could just be habit. You know, we're not totally, we're definitely not clairvoyant. There's just, I like this, I'm not sure why, feelings. Yes? Like when you came to the Dharma in this life, you were like, I don't know what they're saying, but I like it. <laughs> yeah? When you first came to a Dharma center, I don't know what on earth they're on about, but I feel some sort of relief or connection or home. And you saw these images and you were like, huh, I like it. I don't know why. What's going on there? Too many arms. Four arms? Why? Anyway, I like you. Do you remember when you first met the Dharma in this life? There was just like an affinity. And there was just kind of a, ah, I'm curious. We want to keep that and we want to grow that. So make sure that you love your life in the Dharma so that you will want to keep on going with the Dharma life after life. So the power of relinquishment is about pacing. And if you're starting to feel that fatigue, you say to yourself, in order to continue what I love, I have to stop now for a sec. Which means when you rest, you actually do want to pick up where you left off. If you push it to the, to the breaking point, then once you've rested, you just kind of want to slide into an indulgent space or you want to do some other kind of work, it, you have less kind of will to go back to what you started. It's, it's like climbing up a rock face to kind of get to where you were before you burnt out. Do you guys know this feeling? It's so hard pacing. It is the hardest thing to learn on the spiritual path because some days you've got all the energy in the world and some days you got nothing and all the variations in between. So a good practice is one that makes sense for your energy level that day. And there are times when you have to push it a little, but don't make pushing your default modality or you'll start to resent the very thing that you love. I love what you're saying, always very helpful. And I think it's because I'm an extra, extrovert, it feels good. It's like, until it doesn't feel good, it feels good. Yeah. So the, maybe that's what you're saying, why the pacing is so hard because I don't know that I'm pushing or that I'm burning out. And then suddenly I'm over the cliff and I can't think or speak or do anything. Yeah. So I don't know if you have any suggestions 
for, I mean, particularly at a Dharma center with a teacher doing the things that I already love to do. They bring me so much joy that I don't know any other way to say it, except that it feels good. Yeah. Yeah. And right. It feels right. Like this is what you want to be doing with your life. And what a wonderful thing to have met a path and activities related to the path that all resonate and are in alignment. Like what a boon, you know? And I, I think that it's so difficult to unpack our Dharma life and our Dharma like career from what society says a job and a career should be. You know, like sometimes uh, when I come to a new Dharma center, they say, so what are your hours? And I'm like, this is my life, man. Like, what do you mean? What are my hours? Like, I'll get up, I'll do some practice. Is that on the clock or off the clock? Then I'll have breakfast. I'll try to be mindful. Is that on the clock or off the clock? Then I'll be teaching and then I'll be, you know, (laughs) but like, is this is my life, man. Like, I'm going to work hard, but (laughs) like, what do you mean? And yeah, yeah, there seems to be a need for some definable parameters, right? Yeah, and, and but I'm, the, the example is right now. So right now, I have been up since three o'clock this morning. I have been going nonstop. I was totally exhausted. And then I got back here. Back, I'm at a Dharma Center. I got back here and I start talking to people. And then I remember, oh, there's a teaching. And suddenly my energy comes up, which is wonderful. I love this feeling, but this is why I end up pushing because it feels good. It feels right. As you're saying. Yep. And, and there's the other piece, which is sometimes when you have momentum, you don't want to stop your momentum. You know, that feeling, Uh, right? Like you're on a roll. So you want to just keep going because if you stop, it'll be hard to kind of like get up to speed again. Yeah. You know, like it took a while to kind of like work yourself up to that level of work and activity. And so to interrupt it, then you have to kind of recalibrate. Right. I I think it's really interesting when I'm with some of the senior nuns, there's a senior nun in Australia who's my good friend. (laughs) She's been ordained since the dawn of time. I don't know how long, but when you go grocery shopping with her, she moves slowly, but we're so much quicker than with anyone else. Like her, because her mind is really clear. She doesn't have to go, shall I get carrots or shall I get oranges first? Uh There's a clarity that just makes her incredibly efficient. So it Uh feels like you're walking really slowly through the aisles, but you don't have to go through the aisles more than once because she knows exactly where to get things, you know? Mm, Yeah. And so it's something about having a stable clarity that's very awake. And that awake focus can move quite slowly, but with this incredible efficiency. And we're just used to energy looking like speed. Yeah. If you're noticing yourself having energy that looks like speed, there is totally a context for that. But if you can ever take a minute and just ask, what would the slower, more efficient version of this look like? Hmm. Yeah the slower efficient version of this. And, you know, then I don't have to repeat steps. Then I don't have to go back to emails. Then I don't have to recheck because it's actually sticking as I go, but it's, it's aggravating to your psyche. If you're used to speed and you're used to speed carrying you. So don't be abrupt and suddenly try and change your style, but just kind of have that awareness of, is there a slower, more efficient way to do this? Yeah. I can feel that as you're saying it, it's like, I can sit here, maybe I'm tired, but if I can slow down, because I actually think when I get tired, I get more speedy. Yep, totally. That is, it's really totally. And you can operate on that level for a while and it's even got a high to it, but then the crash at the end is really going to take time to recover from. And I'm very familiar, unfortunately. As are we Thank all. you so much. As are we all. And we'll keep doing it. We'll do the wrong thing a million times. Who cares? But like if in the back of the mind, we're like, okay, this time, this time, how do I make adrenal fatigue less of a thing? Mm-hmm. You know, this time, how do I actually enjoy the moment a little bit more? Mm-hmm. You know, and steady Thank you. on. Yeah. 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 And Thank you so much. The, the other piece of this power of relinquishment, I'll bring it back on the screen, is just noticing, noticing when you're tired. And that is a hard thing to notice. 
particularly in a society where it's very easy to equate rest with laziness when in fact rest is efficiency. Rest is efficiency is our new mantra. Speed is not efficiency. Resting periodically means you don't need the giant rest later, which is so hard to come back from. Just, you know, hear that there are not a million, there are not many things that I know experientially, but what I do know experientially is what you do wrong. Okay. <laughs> what to do wrong. And I, I want to practice the Dharma forever. And racing to the end is not a good idea. We have to have the marathon mentality and the marathon mentality that also can enjoy the scenery and enjoy the water and take pit stops all while knowing we're going this way. Because if you sprint and you hurt yourself, then you kind of even sometimes go off the path into la la land for goodness knows how long. And then you have to kind of scramble back up the bank and find the path again, and then kind of like look who's running. Oh, they're totally different people than we're running before. I lost my friends. I have to make new friends. And it's actually not efficient to race. Yeah, because you'll hurt yourself and then the scramble and all of that. So people won't always understand your needs and your boundaries when you're pacing yourself. And that's part of the peer pressure that's hard is they're not always going to honor and respect your boundaries. But if you yourself know, I have this many hours today, and that's what I have. I don't have to apologize. I don't have to explain. This is what I have. And, you know, and if I overcommitted, I'm just going to say, I overcommitted. <laughs> you know, we all do it and say, look, I thought I could do this much. I can actually only do this much. How are we going to figure out the shortfall? And then with like, with, but with no defensiveness, it's so hard, isn't it? Like to just say, actually this amount I thought I could do, I can't help. Like often people are happy to help. It's just, we kind of suffocate that space with our defensiveness and our need to explain and our need to kind of prove that we're still good even though we can't do as much as we thought we could. You know, it's just like, let yourself be a human being. People will love you for it. You know, but that's part of the problem of our society, right? Sometimes when I when I visit Taiwan and I love Taiwan very much, um, the nuns there they work from 4 a.m. until 10 p.m. So that's kind of a rough schedule, right? 4 a.m. to 10 p.m. is is rough, and there are no days off, right? There are no days off, but I am not so tired there, strangely, and it's because the way they pace the day. They pace the day beautifully. And they pace it from sometimes a tactile activity, sometimes a standing activity, sometimes a prostrating activity, sometimes a sitting activity, sometimes a totally maintenance, brainless, you don't even have to think about it. Let's just wash dishes in an assembly line. Now, sometimes let's do these very complex prayers. Now, sometimes this, you know, so they pace it in such a way that at the end of the day, you just hit the pillow and you go straight to sleep. You're not like ruminating over what ifs, and you're also just too tired, <laughs> but you're happy tired. You know, it's the happy tired. And when we are tired, but not happy tired, we don't go to sleep right away, do we? What we need is sleep, but we can't sleep because we're just ruminating over what we should have done, what we didn't do right, all this, all that. Man, uh, but those days that you've really done your pacing well, oh, you sleep well those days. You just hit the pillow like thunk. It's great. And those times in Taiwan, I share a room with nine other people, which is like my worst nightmare. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and they're not quiet. They snore. They make snuffly noises. They fart. They're human beings. It's horrible. But it's fine. Right? Whereas if it was with a bunch of, you know, quote, Westerners, I think I would go insane because we're all so up in each other's business and competitive and performative and, you know, oh, you're sleeping before me, I could stay up later. And like, there's just all this like subtle nonsense that is too exhausting to make us share space well. But in some of these other countries, I think we can really learn a lot about how to manage our energy 
you know, like when to be small and unobtrusive and when to be big and inspiring and how to kind of work with that as well as working with pacing. So it's a brave person that can do boundaries unapologetically, but I think we can all work up to it and maybe model that for each other too. So back to this power of steadfastness, this confidence, because I think it's really important. Okay, so we did this as a meditation last week, but we didn't unpack it totally. The first pride, unafflicted pride, and it's tricky because they call it pride, but um, it's under the heading, the power of steadfastness, sometimes translated as firmness, sometimes translated as positive pride, sometimes translated as confidence. So if you want to complete what you've committed yourself to do, cultivate three types of unafflicted pride, action, ability, and afflictions. So pride about action means no matter who else may be your companion, as you practice on the path, you do not count on them, but accomplish it yourself alone. And from engaging in the Bodhisattva deeds, it states, I alone shall do it. This is pride about action. And this is a mentality, right? This is not rugged individualism. Okay, so hear that. To think I will do this alone does not mean you will do it alone. Okay, it's the mentality that doesn't need. And you know how much help a needy person gets. Not much, right? But if you have this come what may, I am doing it, that often inspires support from others. But it has to be genuine, you can't fake it. You think whatever it is you're doing, this is so important that whether people understand or support me or not, I am doing this whether they understand or support me or not, whether I am seen, whether I am validated, I think this is important. And the joy of the work itself is enough for me to do it. It would be nice to have help, but I'm not counting on it. That mentality is the mentality we need with our spiritual path. In effect, what will happen is we'll be surrounded by companions, but it's, it's such a tricky thing because do you know this feeling of when you really, really want support and no one is there for you? And then there's another time when you don't need support, you're feeling fine. And then suddenly you have all this validation and support. And you think, where were you last week? Last week, I was having a rough time. Last week, I needed you. Where are you then? I'm fine now. And you're kind of harumph. Yeah, you know this feeling? It's not a coincidence. <laughs> it is not a coincidence that we got all sorts of help when we stopped needing it. Yeah, this is not a fluke of your own life. This is when you are needy, hungry, desperate, people run away. Yeah, and it's not fair. And a really good friend will stick with you even when you're needy, desperate, whatever. But most people are not big enough to hold you there. And even if they did, would it help when you're in that deprivation mentality? When you're in a deprivation mentality, your needs are a bottomless pit. So even if you do have all the support you need, it's not going to feel like enough. People say all the words you always wanted to hear. Yeah, people tell you all the things you always wanted to hear. It won't feel like enough. They'll strategize to help you with this work and this task. But somehow you're annoyed with them or it's not quite right. Yeah. And then as soon as you stop needing them, there they are. Yeah. So that's aggravating, but it's true and it's good to know, yes? When you don't need them, they're there. But also if they're not there, it's no problem. If you're not there, it's no problem. Can you think of times in your life though when this has been the case, when you've finally decided, I'm doing this. I don't care if no one else wants to do it. And then suddenly people wanted to join you. Could have just been a party, yeah? Could have been a hike, yeah? But you, were, you genuinely were happy to do it alone. And that is the very thing that got you support. Now, you'll hear Lama Zopa Rinpoche say this a lot in dedications. Yes, have you heard Rinpoche say this? You know, he'll do, you might be asleep by then, right? fair enough. But when he does dedications and it lasts for some time, um, sometimes an hour of just the dedications, he often ends it with, by myself alone. 
And if you're tired and full of angst and need to sleep, you think alone? <laughs> what about these 200 other people here? Right? Are they not gonna help me? Oh, right? Or by myself alone, but Rinpoche, won't you help me? He's talking about joyous effort. And if ever there was someone with joyous effort, it would be that being, yes? His body has the aspect of having suffered tuberculosis, having diabetes, having had a stroke, being in his 70s. He'll just keep going, right? Like his attendants have to physically be like, oi, must eat something. And he's like, oh, I have a body, you know? And it's not to say that if we have had a stroke and we have diabetes and we've suffered from tuberculosis that we should be just the same. We do not have the same capacity of mind to meet all of those conditions so joyfully. But he does show us what's possible and that's inspiring. So when you hear myself alone, there's a lot of layers there. Do you, do you have questions or thoughts about that one? It's, it's kind of a confronting one. Pride in action. Can you see how it would be useful? Yeah, go ahead, Tenzin. I was just thinking, um, why is it, or how is it positive pride, the word pride and not confidence? I'm finding it hard to connect to that. Yeah, and, and I'm using the translation that's in um, the Lamrim Chenmo, and we'd have to ask the, I don't know, the Padmatara <laughs> translation. Um, some translators do just call it confidence confidence in action as opposed to pride in action. Um, pride is almost always described as an affliction, the looking down on others. But in this context, it's really talking about the feeling of I can, I can do it. So maybe it's the strength of the feeling of I and the can that makes it sound like pride, even though it's an unafflicted version. But um, yes, we'd have to ask the translators, how come not confidence? So, and maybe so, I don't know. Do you do you know t the Tibetan? Is is it maybe there's not enough words in Tibetan or not enough words in English? Um, my my Tibetan is actually not that great, but there's a word, uh, for yeah. pride, when you're babuchua, when you're prideful, um, which is actually used in good and bad ways. So right. you can use that positively and negatively. You could, we could say that man, uh, that man is shushu, which means he's very prideful. Mm, you know, or, like you or oh. <laughs> yeah, or <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it's actually okay English because there's that same thing, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, and in English, we sometimes say, have a little pride, meaning mm -hmm. have dignity or yeah. have integrity have a little yeah, pride, yeah. you know, and, you know, but then sometimes, oh my gosh, they have so much pride. It's like yuck, arrogance, what you get away, you know? So it's a, mm -hmm. it's a tricky word. Yeah, it is. it's, it's actually a word that I find um, I have difficulty uh, with, like just, oh, being prideful, like you're supposed to be prideful or you're supposed to have pride. And then I'm, I always, I don't know, I just always feel like there's a negative connotation, but maybe that's just me. Context. Yeah, so to context. understand it better, positive pride um, would be, uh, let's say, confidence with not as much I in it. Yeah, it's, it, it is very much related to potential and future. It's like, I can do this when the conditions come together, when my strength has been developed, when I meet the right supports for it, I can do this. And if I can't do this, it's not a failing. It's not a deficiency. It's just not enough conditions. Yeah, or not enough effort yet. And so, uh, you know, confidence is tricky because it's in a way identifying with who you will be rather than who you are, or identifying with the fact that you are trainable or you can learn things or, you know. So it's, it's a delicate thing, but actually your potential is far more close to the reality of you your afflictions and your deficiencies and all of this stuff this is removable temporary garbage it's not you and it will be discarded you know you won't carry it with you to enlightenment it's baggage you'll leave behind so 
makes more sense to kind of shift your identification to this. Yeah, when or the the um, basically it's it's not true because when when you say by myself alone, I mean you can't it can't be real because you are all, we are all interdependent and uh, as you said there's um, a, a potentiality to do it but we are it depends on your teachers on your but when they say by myself alone is to push the mind of like students like us to to go for it right i i, yes. I take it as something the mentality that, it's a mentality. Yeah. Yep. And it's a mentality that only works if it is genuine. If you genuinely think I will do this by myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can't fake it. Um, but some, you know, otherwise you don't have the same joy of it and the same resiliency from it. Um, and there will be in fact times when you feel very alone. And there will be times when your practice doesn't seem supported by the gurus mm -hmm. or the Buddhas or your friends or anyone and come what may, you're going to do it anyway. And when yeah. you land in that space, you have inner support that manifests. And that inner support sometimes then reaches out and connects with all of the outer support that was already there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it doesn't because there's not enough conditions for it. But this is about kind of continuous, sustainable momentum. Yeah, and so really thinking, it also helps you with pacing. If you think I have to do this by myself alone, then I have to pace it, assuming I won't get support. If I get support, that's a wonderful bonus and it'll make things go smoother and quicker, yay. But kind of, you know, it helps with your pacing because if you're assuming you're gonna get all this backup, sometimes then you're really um, left out to dry. Yeah. So, yeah, then you know- laziness comes. Yeah, and you know, we have to assume that people will fail us because they have afflictions, not because they want to, not because they're bad, but people will fail us. They'll promise things they can't live up to. They'll commit to things they can't do, just as we do. So if we have kind of a, a punitive punishing attitude that resents that about them, that's not fair, that's everybody. Mm -hmm. But if we have this idea of, I'll do this, help might come, then we're going to be a lot less resentful when there isn't the support. Yeah, we are, we are not going to judge everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. So then we had pride about ability, which is again this confidence. And it means that you accomplish your own and others' welfare thinking. Since living beings are under the power of afflictions, they are unable to achieve even their own welfare, much less the welfare of others. I am able to accomplish the welfare of both myself and others. And you think this without any conceit or any contempt of others. So this is the most tricky one for tipping into actual pride. It's confidence, but it can really easy turn into arrogance. But what you're saying is genuinely, secretly, <laughs> we are in a unique position we really are in a very unique position that what? We have physical independence, we have enough mental intelligence to learn new things, and we've come across a profound spiritual path. And we have some space and time in our life to engage with it. We might take that for granted and think, oh sure, but doesn't everyone? No, they don't. Lots of people smarter than us, lots of people healthier than us, lots of people who have Dharma centers around them, but for all the conditions to come together is incredibly rare. So you really do try and have that, that adage, if not me, then who? If not now, then when? And we can kind of put ourselves down and say, but who am I? I don't know anything. And it's like, yeah, but you have all the supports you need to learn it. You have all the things you need to move forward with it. And not everyone has those conditions. So that doesn't make you better than them. That means that you're responsible. Yeah, it means that you're in this really unique position to benefit society as a whole, to bring things to a deeper level. Lots of people out there like do-gooders, doing good, but what they're doing is samsara symptoms relief. They're making samsara a little bit more bearable for people. And bless them for that. Thank you very much. 
yeah but some of us have conditions to actually help get people out of samsara to own, to end our own samsara and so because we have those conditions we think these sentient beings don't have the same opportunities as me i need to be bigger than their afflictions and this ties into a little bit with with what um uh, Donnie was saying earlier about the lion or the lioness perspective, where you really feel like I need to be in a leadership position, even if I have no authority. That leadership and authority don't have to go together. Leadership and hierarchy don't have to go together. Leadership is setting tone, is modeling, is just living what you believe. And you could be in the lowest position, you could be the servant, you could be the dishwasher, you could be someone so unnoticed, but actually be the leader of a community or helping to set the tone of the community, because you're holding your path with genuineness. And because of that, it has a direct influence on the people around you. So just kind of adopting this like inner quiet leadership. How can I model what I believe in? It protects your mind from the pettiness of people, but it also can bring out the best in people as well. So that's what this type of pride is, this positive confidence is about. Not everyone can do this. I'm in a unique position to do this, so I better. <laughs> yeah. Can you feel the difference though, how it's, it's not thinking you're better than anyone else, just that the conditions have really come together for you, so use them? And of course, these are not things that you tell people like, look, I know you haven't met the Dharma. Since I have, I'm going to help you out. You know, like you're not going to be gross like that. It's an inner conversation. <laughs> and then the last one is pride about afflictions. And this is called because you have contempt for the afflictions and then want to destroy them. With contempt for the afflictions on all occasions, you think, I shall be victorious over these. They shall never defeat me. It means being steadfast after you have generated the courageous thought to destroy the incompatible factors. So you're really thinking, I will not let anger, attachment, pride, jealousy, ignorance, I'm not going to let these get the better of me anymore. That actually I am bigger than these, I am better than these, I can move through these, I can stop believing these, and what's more, I'm at war with these, they are not me. They are what are ruining my peace, they are ruining my connection with others, enough. Okay, so it's pride about afflictions because your pride is more in your Buddha nature than thinking your afflictions are you. Yeah, you think I shall be triumphant, it's a good attitude to have because sometimes we feel like we are our afflictions and it's really important that we start to de-identify from them and just go, oh yeah, there's anger. Anger is not useful. Not, I am such a bad, angry person. Not useful, not true. Just, oh, there's anger. Yeah, that is a bugger. I do not want this in my life. Enough of you. Do you feel the difference, right? It's an important nuance. This power of steadfastness has those subcategories. You don't need to memorize them. You don't need to go back over it. It's, it's really just about picking the little gems of what resonate with your own wisdom already and coming back to those intentionally again and again, because it's gonna support your joy. It's gonna support your joyous effort. It's useful to read through these sections again, but don't kind of give yourself, I guess, study pressure. Yeah, there's lists and lists and lists and lists in Buddhism. It's good to know where the lists live. <laughs> it's good to know where the resources are, but don't feel like you need to like prepare for an exam. It's just, okay, that one bit in the joyous effort section that made my little brain go ting, I've got to repeat that again and again to myself so it sticks. Because you have a wisdom, but you'll lose the lesson if you don't repeat it to yourself. So there's a lot in the joyous effort section, you know, and we don't need to go over it in too much detail. It's all variations on a theme. We mostly have looked at this armor like joyous effort, even though I didn't give you the heading of that. And this was the one that's overcoming the three types of laziness. So 
you know, you both, you basically are vowing, I shall dedicate myself for eons to benefit even one sentient being. So you're not going to fall prey to procrastination, pursuing meaningless activities, self-contempt. You're not going to do that, or at least try. And these support joyous effort. It's armor-like. You're protecting yourself from what steals your power or what makes you weak. You're armoring yourself against your own laziness. Um, joyous effort of acting constructively is supported by aspiration to benefit sentient beings, making our mind energetic and delighted to practice. So this is just kind of the engagement part. And then benefiting sentient beings is the reaching out to help the same groups of sentient beings that we talked about in the ethical conduct section. So like particularly people struggling mentally or physically or don't have as many resources as we do. So this is joy, joyous effort in a nutshell. Um, any hanging effort, joyous effort thoughts before we move on to concentration? No? Okay, so we'll have a five minute break and then just a brief concentration overview because it's quite simple to understand, it's just hard to do. So we'll do a very quick concentration and then we'll do our meditation. So five minute break and shifting gears. Now we'll do just an introduction to concentration and then jump right into a concentration meditation. So most of you know, there are lots of types of meditation. They're divided into single pointed meditations and analytical meditations, and some that combine elements of both with visualization. So single pointed analytical tantra. Yeah. Um, in Tibetan Buddhism, even people who are not tantric practitioners get little elements of tantra sometimes with visualization and mantra. Um, for other traditions, there's a lot of meditations that have an element of single pointedness and an element of analysis within the same session. Um, so there's a lot of correct ways, there's a lot of ways to approach it. But for all, concentration really means hitting the flow state. Yeah, hitting the flow state where you are focused with no stress, where you are relaxed without being sleepy. Yeah, so normally when we're focused, we are also stressed. Normally when we're relaxed, we are also sleepy. Yes, but for concentration, we really want to be very, very focused while being relaxed, that kind of sweet spot. And in this context, the perfection of concentration it's understanding that all of the other perfections will be deeper and more powerful if we have more focus. So we need a laser-like gaze on each of these other perfections in order to really integrate them into how we are. So concentration is always going to have an object. Even if the object is something kind of abstract like the mind, you're always meditating on something. You can be meditating on emptiness, right? Meditating on emptiness is not emptying out the mind or nihilism. We know that we're just saying that because it needs to be said. Okay. <laughs> um, when you're doing meditation, you want to remember that whatever the object is, spacious, not spacey. Yeah, you're holding it with a spacious, relaxed mind that is in no way vague or heavy, which is not Alf with the fairies, which is not reminiscing. No, you're just holding it in that spacious holding, like the way you would if you were enjoying a difficult drive that you've done many times. This is the analogy I like. Um, when I lived in New Zealand, the road from the little town to the Dharma Center was along the sea, and it was like this sharp drop off into the sea with no guardrail but it was so pretty. So you wanted to like look at the sea, but you also didn't want to die. You know, there was that kind of like, ah, but it's so pretty, but don't look, but it's so pretty, but don't look. Um, but after you do that drive many, many times, you know where it's a sharp turn and you know where it's a smooth turn. And so you can kind of get into that flow state of just a beautiful drive, but you have to keep your wits about you. You know, you can't kind of drift off into dreamland because you know, if you do, you'll just fall off the cliff and die. 
Yes, but you've done it enough times that you're not tight or freaked out. So it's alert, but it's joyful alert. So think about the ways you are. Maybe if you're very good at a sport. Yeah, um, I was never particularly good at sports, but sometimes when I played basketball as a kid, the team would synchronize. You know that feeling when the team is like all on the same page and I knew this person is open. If I pass the ball to her, she's going to catch it and she's going to make the, the shot. It's going to be all in the flow. And every once in a while, the team would just synchronize and there'd be that flow state of focus during a sport. Some of you will know this one. Or sometimes for runners, you get that flow state. Lots of artists, when they're in the zone, get that kind of focus where they're very clear, they're very sharp, but they're also really blissful and relaxed. So there's somewhere in your life where you've touched that somewhere. Sometimes it's like computer jobs. You randomly get into a flow with your computer jobs and you're like in the zone, yeah? Whatever the case may be, you kind of take that knowing of what the correct concentration is and then apply it to meditation. And you know that you can't just force it. You know that it's something that you're gonna to have to work your way into and half the battle is deciding to find your meditation object interesting. You have to decide that it's interesting. You have to decide that it's important. Hence why we do so many prayers before meditation, because you're working yourself up to holding still with something. We're so, it's so easy to be stimulated. It's so easy to be entertained that when you actually have to sit down and focus on one thing, your mind gets annoyed and it might even feel like anxiety, but is it maybe just boredom? And it's trying to find things to kind of get itself all stimmed up. And you have to say, oi, you, that's understandable. But gently, gently, let's just settle down into this one thing or settle into this one analytical process or absorb into this one visualization. So with single pointed concentration, which is what we're gonna look at specifically with the perfection of concentration, knowing that there's many other types, for single pointed concentration, you can choose a mental image like that of the Buddha. And you can also choose a physical experience like the breath. You can choose the mind itself, or you could choose a concept and meditating single pointedly on a concept is hard, but what you do is you analyze your way into resonance with it, and then you stay there. So you pick something that is very familiar like compassion or love, and you use analytical meditation to get it to strike you, yeah, or to touch you. And then once you're really feeling it, you keep your focus there. With meditating on the nature of the mind, you have to do a little bit of sifting through all the mental factors and not getting distracted by them, and then coming to the primary mental consciousness. And you can use all sorts of tools like thinking, sky, not clouds, yes, <laughs> or water, not fish, or whatever analogy works, and then let it go. And once you hit it, you stay there, right? With a mental image, and that's what we're going to do next. It's, it's, it can sometimes be easier depending on if you're a visual person or not. So you take something that you've actually seen in real life and then you close your eyes and you bring to your mind's eye your memory of it. So you're not looking at anything once you're meditating, but you're using something that you've seen. And so many of us have a little Buddha statue of about this size, shape, and color. Yeah, about this big. Yeah, a couple inches high. Shiny is important. Heavy is important. Because you want something that's going to keep your mind from flying away off into la-la land, but is bright enough to keep you wakeful. And you choose something like the Buddha because even if your concentration doesn't get much better, you're increasing your positive association with a virtuous object. So you're accumulating tons of merit and positive associations, even if your concentration isn't so good. It's not ever time wasted. Okay, so that is the intro and we can unpack it a bit more. 
But before we do the meditation, I'm just going to show you the picture that I, this is the nine stages of meditation, um, or the nine stages to developing shine, shamatha, single pointed attention. And this is a very ancient, hundreds of years old image. And it basically shows you what is needed to get perfect calm abiding or perfect single pointed concentration. And it starts with renunciation. So renunciation is represented by this monastery, this little, little sliver of a monastery at the very bottom. And this means you want to get out of samsara. That's why you're focusing. <laughs> yes, why am I focusing so hard? Why am I putting so much effort into this? Because I want to be free from samsara. And a distracted mind cannot get this freedom. Yeah, so you start there. And then you think, who am I? I'm the little monk. Yes, you, we are all the little monk. And the monk at the different locations on the path indicates the development of the nine stages to calm abiding. And the little hook that he's holding, which is not particularly clear there, but this little hook is that we need introspection. And the little lasso is mindfulness. So mindfulness is non-forgetfulness of the virtuous object. So it's not forgetting. Introspection is making sure you don't leave it. Yeah, so you need the two to keep your focus going. Okay, and those are the nine stages. We'll come back to them, but it's basically as you would, it just is a gradual process that gets better through repetition. And we'll come back to that maybe next week. And the fire, which you see here, is effort. So it starts with a big fire, which means in the beginning you need more effort. And as time goes by, you need less effort, which is really good news. So it's the hardest it's ever going to be right now. It's not going to be harder than this. That is such good news. It's not like, oh gosh, this is going to just keep getting harder and harder. No, it's going to get easier and easier. So don't worry. And we'll come back to the whole image. Um, you know, if later you want to look at the recording, you can look at what it all represents, but we can unpack that later. Right now, we're going to just do this very simple meditation, which is to visualize a positive mental object, see it visually, and then close your eyes and bring it to your mind's eye and stabilize. And I've got a nice little Buddha here for you, but if you have one in your house, you prefer to visualize, that's fine. Okay, so that's the meditation we're about to do, is to bring it to your mind's eye. Yes. And then you'll lose it. You know, it'll drift or it'll get bigger or smaller. And you might have to open your eyes and look at it again. And then close your eyes, bring it back to your mind's eye, front and center, and just hold it steadily. And whenever you get distracted, you just gently bring yourself back to your memory of it. Not too tight, not too loose, no expectations. Just see. Okay. All right. So into a good meditation posture, straight back. And just kind of let yourself breathe into your space. Let go of any physical tension if you can and get yourself balanced and grounded physically. And be like a witness to your own posture. Is it a gentle posture that is upright without tightness? Strong, not rigid. And let the front of your body just be soft and receptive without holding any muscles or tightening anything. Strong back, soft front. And then we remind ourselves that we need concentration for everything in our life, to have more power, to have more depth. But in particular, we need concentration 
in order to become enlightened. For all of these good qualities that we value to have more strength. And that so many of our mistakes were simply because we had a distracted mind, a mind that wasn't as good at focusing. And so our afflictions just filled the gap. So more concentration means fewer mistakes, fewer afflictions. May we achieve the perfection of concentration in order to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient things. And so think of a positive mental object, easiest is Shakyamuni Buddha, and look at it visually, size, shape, color, Whatever you decide, think of it as bright and luminous, but also having a little bit of weight. And when you have some of the details clear, then bring it to your mind's eye and stabilize your focus on it. Eyes mostly closed. Just keep your focus on your memory of the image, your visualization of the image. And it doesn't matter if it's not clear, just keep returning your focus to your intention for it to be there. And if your mind starts to drift, you can open your eyes for a moment and revive your memory. And then close your eyes again, having the image in your mind's eye. And then think that the image dissolves into light, absorbing into you, blessing your body, speech, and mind. And we dedicate 
Chancho Sancho Rimpo She Ma Ke Panam Ke Gyuachi Ke Panyam Pa Me Pa Yi Gone Gondu Pelwa Sho Toni Dawa Rimpo She Ma Ke Panam Ke Gyuachi Ke Panyam Pa Me Pa Yi Gone Gondu Pelwa Sho And you can relax your attention. Okay. So for that kind of meditation, it's good to do short bursts so that you are increasing your focus without building tension or building some sort of habit that's drifting. So sometimes you just set a timer for like a minute, hold it really steadily for a minute, and then take a minute, refresh yourself, stretch, and start again and do another minute because you can kind of gradually build your strength that way. So single pointed focus, um, don't do huge long sessions in the beginning. Um, okay, so that's it for tonight. I think Christina has some announcements just briefly. Uh, yes, thank you. I just wanna mention to all of you, um, there's an, an incredible opportunity this weekend to take a retreat with Venerable Yunten. Um, she is going to be leading a short uh, day and a half retreat. Um, there's just going to be two three hour sessions on Saturday and one uh, three hour, uh, two and a half hour, or excuse me, three hour session on Sunday morning. Um, it is on the Orange Manjushri. Um, it's for those who want to deepen their connection with and understanding of it, Deity Yoga. Um, using various lower Korea action tantra sadhanas. And um, it's basically orange manjushri is for wisdom, memory, and ability. Uh, the techniques to sharpen intelligence and to focus the mind, as well as to cut through the ignorance of oneself and others, which I know I can use personally. <laughs> this practice includes vivid imagery and aspirational pr prayers directly applicable to daily life. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug this in the um, chat. Uh, I went ahead and shared the link with you there. So if you guys are interested, um, please click on that link now because once the chat closes, the link will be gone. Um, you can always email me at spc at medicinebuddha.org as well. Um, but please join. We'd love to see each and one of you, each and every one of you there. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. It'll be a fun weekend. So hope, hopefully you guys can join. It's this one here, Manjushri. Yeah, you see him. There he is. Sword cutting through ignorance. <laughs> All right. So have a good night, you guys. Um, see you soon.